I'm glad to be back. Um, we started this series of conversations to look inside of top CMOs to figure out what's keeping them up at night um, six months ago. I've known Pete for many, many years, and I, I, I've had the good fortune to get to know many of you and, in fact, placed a couple of you in the room tonight. And what we thought we would do tonight, if I could get a slide to come up, um, we thought it might be kind of fun to do a couple different things. We're going to do a little Letterman deal here. I've got 27 and a half minutes to try to get through this. We've got a couple of super special guests that are new CMOs, and we thought it would be fun if we could peer inside their minds and get a sense of what they're tackling in, in their current roles. Darren Marshall, who I'll bring out in a moment, is the new CMO at Steinway, literally three weeks on the job. And my good friend Lee Applebaum is the new CMO at Patron, which we thought would be fitting for this time of day. So it wouldn't be a great um, Letterman-like show without a top 10 list. You may have seen in the Wall Street Journal today, we had a neat little piece that talked about our 10-year study which you know we've been doing for 10 years now. And the reality is it's at 45 months, which really hasn't changed in the last couple of years, which is good news, but we're not happy with that, and I know you're not. But with that in mind, we thought we might walk you through a quick top 10 list of top 10 reasons why it's really tough being a CMO today. Number 10, it's the one job in the world for which most outsiders believe owning a TV set is sufficient qualification to give you advice. Number nine, it's the only job in the company the CEO's spouse is apparently capable of doing a better job than the CMO. You're laughing, but this hurts. We've all been there, right? Number eight, content marketing. Does this suggest that previously we did content-free marketing? Number seven, the data you've been working with all those years, was it small data? <laughs> there are lots of reasons it's tough to be a CMO. Your entire marketing department spends its day surfing the web and smugly asserting it's their jobs. It is really tough to be a CMO today. A Super Bowl ad is entertainment for everyone else, but for you, it's a jury trial. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about on that. My wife loved those cute kids on the at t ads. Why don't we have good ads like that? This is the kind of stuff you guys have to listen to. It's crazy. Number three. You get free advice from people who plainly admit that they don't know anything about marketing, but, and we call that the big but in my business, and you can imagine we hear CEOs all the time talking about that. I didn't come up marketing, but I kind of fancy myself to be a pretty good marketer, that sort of thing. Number two reason why it's tough to be a CMO. It's the only position in all of labor law where the employment contract is actually titled severance agreement. This is true. I've got, I keep copies of these things. You can't make this stuff up. And the number one reason why it's tough to be a CMO today, it's the only job profession for which 10-year odds are listed on the Vegas Sportsbook. All right, we'll put that out. So next, what I would like to do is to introduce a very good friend, Darren Marshall. Darren, if you would, please come out. Um, this is a Darren Marshall. Are you sorry? Right, there's a seat. I see you. Hey. I'm sorry about that piano. Hey, everyone. That piano is not great. Sorry. Uh, it's, sorry. What, what? Um, so here's what we do. <laughs> Why Darren's fixing things for us. So in my world, we, we take we take fabulous careers, 20, 30 year careers, and we have a tendency to boil them down. And this is what I call a career placemat. I'm not going to walk you through it, but trust me, hey, Darren, have a seat. Uh, is an incredibly accomplished head of marketing. And you'll see his career. Proctor got in the restaurant business, was recruited by Coca-Cola, had a number of jobs from Malaysia to Singapore to Thailand to China. This is a really well-rounded marketer that's seen a lot of things in his career. And most recently, he succumbed to a call for, from Steinway. You can imagine that he can play this. He probably wouldn't be caught dead. Well, maybe now playing <laughs> this one. But anyway, Darren, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Greg. So, so if I may... Steinway, from Coca-Cola and Procter. I want to say, what were you thinking? But walk me through how it all came to be and why was it attractive to you? Yeah, well, you know, it, midlife crisis, I think, to a certain degree. Um, uh, been at Coke for a long time and, and sort of was a, that question, do you stay there forever um, or do you go and do something that was new and interesting? Actually, it was one of your colleagues who, uh, a, a subtle pitch for Spencer Stewart, um, one of your colleagues who said, you know, think about the things that make you happy and the things that just really bum you out about your career and put that list together of what that perfect career might be. And so I put a list together of a couple things. I wanted to do something that was global. 
Um, I wanted to do something that really had a change agenda, something that was about premium brands that really could engage with consumers, and something, a role that was really holistic and not just um, functional silos. And, uh, oh, and by the way, I was a, I was a piano major in college um, before business school and all that other sort of stuff. So uh, this came together and it was a it was hand in glove. It was Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, it's always difficult on the outside for a candidate, and quite frankly for us sometimes, to determine what it's actually going to be like. Any surprises? You're three weeks in, so it's all new. Yeah. You know, Can um, you share any tidbits? And this is like Vegas. I hope that what's said here stays here. Yeah, no, of course. Um, it was funny. I was talking to some code people this morning, and, uh, you know, the, the lack of politics, the, the entrepreneurial focus, get things done, was awesome. The, um, the remarkable lack of data, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, growing up at P&G and all the other bits, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a, the way you go about doing things in a typical sort of CPG type of environment. None of that whatsoever. Um, but the benefit of all of that is being able to build something from the ground up and really to make a difference and to, uh, I, I see my role as sort of um, uh, a bit of doing a Harley Davidson type of thing, you know, going from how do you take a brand that used to focus on Hell's Angels to a brand that now focuses on 57 year old uh, dentists and, you know, really brings um, freedom to life. And so that's what we're trying to do with, uh, with, uh, with Steinway. That's great. I know in your last role at Coke, you were in part as part of an incubator working a lot on product innovation. How will product innovation play out at Steinway? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's interesting. The, the, the music world has fundamentally changed. And whether that's instruments or artists, as we'll see later tonight, um, but making um, Changing an entire business model, uh, taking a culture and changing it, taking product and changing it. Um, ours is a product which has been around for 160 years. It's the, the, the finest quality instrument that, that can be made in, in that particular sector. But making it relevant to a, a whole new group of people who may see culture in a different light uh, and may in China think about music in an entirely different light. And that's only going to happen by pushing the envelope, not just with product, but with process and with uh, retail models and go-to-market models and just how we go about doing businesses and creating experiences that are sticky for people. How many Steinway owners in the audience? A handful of people have them. Uh, can you give us some fun facts about the size of the business? You can't just crank out, you can't push the button and make more. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about how many are out there, how many make annually? So there's uh, the company's 160 years old, um, and um, it's a it's actually a really small company in the grand scheme of things, you know, several hundred million dollars. But the the um, the scope of that brand just has such sort of um, gravitas, particularly ag against a certain consumer base. It's interesting that there's two factories, one in New York City, so all of these things are handcrafted in New York City, and the other is in uh, Germany, in Hamburg. Um, trees come in one side, and um, handcrafted instruments with 12,000 pieces, all made by hand out of wood, come out the other side. Um, 2,000 instruments a year, that's it, it's very small. Uh, average price point, about 100 grand. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very different business model than selling Coke to people, 1.7 million times a day. So where might we see Steinway show up in the next five or ten years as you make new friends here? We're all going to be watching for Steinway. Yeah. Yeah. What, no, it's, where um, might you take it? It's, it's, they're high net worth individuals who, um, you know, some of them may be really culturally oriented. Some of them might be really um, brand badge oriented. Um, but they, they're going to need to have a, a bit of a, a bank account to be able to, to bring that, that to life. Um, so we're, we're looking for partners. We have a lot of partners in the luxury space and um, other, whether it's automobiles or wristwatches or jewelry, you know, those sorts of things that, that are part of that luxury hierarchy of needs. And that's what we do. And doing that in a very global sort of way. And how you're, you're literally just three weeks into it. How's your 100 day plan? What's it, what's it look like? How's it going along so far? Yeah, I've got this fire hose. It's yeah. about this big, yeah, um, uh, which has been fun. Um, you really, it's, it's about learning. Um, it's about taking, uh, learning about a manufacturing process and bringing just some simple uh, marketing disciplines. Um, the key thing for me is about building, building what the brand could be and what it should be and then bringing people along to be able to make it happen. Um, we're, we're doing a, a lot of stuff in retail, trying to, to change what our retail experience is going to be all about, what our brand really stands for. 
um, and then scaling that across multiple geographies, particularly emerging markets over the next four Any years. advice for the people in the audience that are stepping into new jobs in their current companies or might be thinking about making a move? As you went through the process, any yeah. wisdom that you can share my with us? My biggest, my biggest learning was just really doing the homework about what turns you on. I mean, what are the things that really make a difference for you? What do you love doing? What do you hate doing? What are the things you're good at? And being disciplined about that, that se selection process and not just picking up um, the, you know, the first call that comes along. You know, your boss may be a complete prick, but um, how do you really plan out what those next steps could be and should be? Mm. Thank you. Speaking of a brand that turns you on, uh, may we go to the screen? Darren, thank you. <laughs> Join us. Thank you, sir. Thanks. So our next guest, if I may, is Lee Applebaum who is, I think, six months into his journey uh, as, let's go all the way to the screen, his, can I do this, sorry. Uh, he is now the CMO at Apple, uh, excuse me, Stu, excuse me, Lee started about six months ago, and you'll see his career track. Lee Applebaum, will you please join us? I got that all screwed up, thank you. you know, I've been drinking Patron all <laughs> afternoon. Sorry, I got caught up with me. So uh, interesting background, if I may, quickly on Lee, and we're not going to keep this up, but just to give you a quick sense. So this is a really interesting, diverse background when you think of Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola to Schlotsky's to Footstar, spent some time at David's Bridal, one of the best in the world about direct-to-consumer, Schottenstein, we actually placed him at Radio Shack, had an amazing run there, and then got a call to go down under with Target in Australia, and we're delighted that he recently showed up at Patron. So Lee, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, how's it going? You've worked for such an amazing brand. T tell us about the process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before I do, candidly, I'm a little, little uncomfortable sitting here at nearly 6 p.m. Which, as far as I'm concerned, at Patron is way past cocktail time. So, uh, <laughs> apparently it's just me. Yeah. Um, you said to find a job you're passionate about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and so I'd, I'd asked uh, if someone would indulge me if there was a cocktail in the I house. I think we might find one there. Fabulous. That's, thank you so much. That's kind of rude, though. Yeah, I, I feel it's a little inappropriate to be candid. Thank you. And so we have a little gift for everybody uh, to share the love. Thank never you never so drink much. alone. Yeah, we have some uh, Patron samplers being uh, passed out here. There they are. Thank you for your help. Uh, so please enjoy it. I, I feel a little like Oprah or Ellen. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. cheers. All right. Uh, feel free. Um, I don't know if you could take them on airplanes or not. So we want no leftover. We can get you ice and we'll move over. But Lee, thank you for that. No pleasure. So, so tell us about, while they're doing that, tell us a little bit about the business. I mean, you've got lots of fans of Patron. Tell us about your amazing owner, how it started, if you don't mind. Yeah. Does anybody really care at this point? No. <laughs> 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 I mean, really. We uh, got tequila and it's six. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, Patron's actually a, a fascinating story, but, but sort of the, the punchline is uh, it was founded by John Paul DeGioia. Many of you may know the name from Paul Mitchell Hair Systems, right? Uh, so this incredible serial entrepreneur uh, grew up in the gangs of L.A., um, so it's not one of these fabricated stories, really a very humble background in L.A. Serial entrepreneur, starts his hair care company, and loved tequila, but loved handmade artisanal tequila created in Jalisco, Mexico, and said, why can't we get that in the U.S., right? We've got this sort of very base product. And so he went about finding the artisanal, handcrafted, 100-year-old sort of process and that was the creation of Patron nearly 25 uh, years ago. Today, he's a uh, very arm's length uh, owner of the business, really provides inspiration more than anything, um, but uh, a brilliant guy to, to really have as the, the sort of the heart and soul of the business. You have been very active on blogging and tweeting about the company. Uh, and if I didn't know better, I think you're making it up the way you talk about this company. Can you give us a sense, because I know it's genuine, yeah. And I experienced a little bit of this with them. Can you talk a little bit about the company and what makes it so 
unbelievably unique. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure you all, those of you on Twitter can appreciate this. People say to me all the time, said, you know, do you actually work in your job? I follow your Twitter feed. And, and my comment is, like everything, right, we curate what we share in Twitter, right? I, I don't share the boring, the mundane, the banging my head against the wall, the reviewing the spreadsheets, the looking at the data. So I share all the sexy, cool stuff. Um, and the good news is there, there is plenty of that. Um, we occupy a space that people love in spirit. Um, tequila, and then more specifically, a brand that, that is admired. Um, and so it's quite a blessing uh, to, to, to work on a brand. We also have a really unique dynamic because we have a lot of celebrities who love the product. Um, we have a policy at Patron, and it's been this way since its founding, that we have never, ever paid for an endorsement, ever. Not a dime. We never do it. Everything is organic. Um, that's not to say that when a couple months ago Sir Paul McCartney in Rolling Stone kind of gave a shout out to Patron that we didn't send him a bottle as a thank you on the back end, but never proactively. Um, and so there's a neat part of my job tweeting about and talking about and meeting with celebrities. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it's no different than all of us, right? I mean, I know there was a discussion about big data. Well, we're mired in better understanding our customer, who they are. How do we grow our usage occasion? Um, perhaps it's not uh, increasing quantity at a given moment, but increasing frequency. Um, you know, thinking about global reach, we're 95% domestic right now. Um, but you look at what's happening now in China with fine spirits uh, and other growing economies. So uh, spend a lot of my time thinking about emerging markets, looking at data, things that are no different than anybody else. Can you give us a quick 101 on tequila, on great yeah. tequila? Yeah, yeah. So one thing, uh, a couple things. Number one, tequila is a little bit like champagne or cognac, right? It's very specific to the state of Jalisco, Mexico. If it is not made there, it is not tequila. So if you've heard of mezcal, right? not made in the state of tequila, therefore it sort of bears the broader name. Um, there's a licensing organization in Mexico who governs and manages the production of tequila um, and does it very, very caref carefully and consciously. Um, they're very proud of the spirit that's made. The, the spirit is actually a really complex one. Those of you who are wine drinkers, it's not quite as complex, so terroir, the land, doesn't play as important a role. Um, all of our tequila is made from the highlands. So there's basically the highlands of Jalisco, sit up around 1,500 meters, and the lowlands. The best tequila comes from the highlands, and that's where we happen to make ours. Other than that, it's pretty much Mother Nature. A little bit of yeast, a little bit of luck, some oak, new oak, old oak, French, American, some interesting bourbon barrels we use, rum charred barrels, and you end up with uh, a very beautiful and actually noble spirit. And Patron was really founded on the idea of correcting the misperception that many of us had in college, right, which was that worm on the end of the bottle, and we had that tequila memory and that tequila experience. But at the end of the day, it's actually a very, very fine spirit. Um, we don't talk about some of the medicinal benefits because people uh, sort of cringe when they hear about them, but there actually have been a number of published studies. Uh, those of you, we we'll, won't talk Please about your- Please share this. Yeah. Now you need to I won't get it. into prostate health here, but there are benefits for prostate health. So if anybody questions that, just tell them you're doing good for your prostate. Yeah, and actually, yeah, 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 good, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. Um, to your prostates. And then um, the New England Journal of Medicine actually just released a study uh, on obesity, as a matter of fact. So again, we're not going to take and run with it, but about the consumption of tequila and a binding agent we for are so that cause obesity. for tonight. Yeah, there you go. Typical week. Tell us, uh, coming from your most recent situation at Target, how different is going back into CPG? Yeah. Big change for you? Yeah, I think those, how many of you are in retail, either directly or somewhat indirect? All right, yeah. Um, I feel like I'm moving in slow motion, right? Going back to my CPG days, right? The PD cycle is a lot slower. Um, we also have mother nature to contend with. We just released a four-year-old tequila, right? That was concepted actually over six years ago. Things that I'm talking about now with my team, some of them are decade-long projects before they come to fruition. Um, and that's somewhat painful. The, the flip side of it is I can be a heck of a lot more deliberate with my team and a heck of a lot more thoughtful and strategic. You know, I don't have to wake up every morning and look at the dreaded flash sales report and all of a sudden do a 180. Um, but I think like everything, the, you know, the old proverb, the grass, is, the grass is always greener, I think is true. I long sometimes for that cadence and that pace, but being thoughtful and strategic is welcome. Well, one of the things, I'd be interested in both your opinions here, one of the things that new CMOs often struggle with is how do you develop that cadence with your boss? Reporting, relationships, expectations, can either or both of you comment on how do you, I mean, you're laying new pipe entirely, I would assume, yeah. Darren. 
Yeah, I, you know, it's it's any human relationship, right? It's it's getting to know people with uh, true honesty and sincerity, and understanding what what um, what g gets them excited about things. Um, I've learned over time that you need to be a chameleon. I mean, it's not about how I work; it's about how the people around me work, um, and how can I be most relevant to them. It's the same way that we market our products to consumers. We need to market our products to our bosses or to our peers or to you know, our owners, as the case may be. It's a simple trick that some people fall down on, not doing the check-in. What do you want to see more of? What would you see, like to see less of? Yeah. Uh, Lee, in your case, you replaced someone who had been in the role for a long time and was revered, mm -hmm. which is different than most of the situations we get called right. in on typically. Um, how did that make it extra difficult or easier for you walking into the job? Yeah, great question. So the, the, the gentleman I replaced had been at the helm for 10 years, incredibly successful. In fact, I credit him, at least from a marketing perspective, entirely with building the brand and its stature. Um, and he made a voluntary decision to retire. Um, the, the beauty was, the guy's name was Matt Carroll. Matt um, agreed to stay on in transition. And I was a little skeptical, to be quite candid, we both were, we talked about this, for, for two or three months. Uh, taught me a lot about what it means to do a, a true handoff. Um, provided you know, his experience, his background, his perspective, um, but then never sort of told me how it needed to be done, how it should be done. Gave me the freedom, really more than anything, I think he told me when there might be a pitfall. Um, helped me and coached me in working with, with my boss, our CEO, or with John Paul, our founder. Um, and, and I can say this because Matt, Matt isn't here, really was absolutely the perfect example of what a flawless transition uh, should look like. But you know, when you look at all of our brand health metrics, the sort of awareness aided and unaided, I used to say the only place we can go is down. So it's a bit of a daunting task in, in that regard. Are there any pictures buried in that, by the way? That is one of the most beautiful graphics. Is there anything in there you can tell us or not? Uh, well, here's an interesting yeah. thing for you. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, listen. I'm just looking over your shoulder going, wow, that is really cool. Anyone cracked a bottle open or am I the only, we're the only three guys? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> thank you. Rick, right, Rick. Yeah, Never drink you. alone. Yeah, yeah cheers. Um, no, and a little interesting story. I've been asked about the B uh, before. And, and by the way, I think it's one of our, it's one of our most recognizable brand assets and one of our most uh, under leveraged. Uh, it's funny. The, again, the CMO, 10 years, so close to the brand, um, didn't even, I think, understand fully or appreciate fully the, the power of that bee. And people have said, why a bee? Uh, agave is actually not, you've ever seen an agave plant? It's actually not a cactus, it's a lily. And the beauty, again, of Mother Nature is what she does every seven years when that agave plant is ready to be harvested is she shoots a flower up, a lily comes straight up. Well, and that lily attracts bees. Uh, and those bees tell us that the agave is ready to be harvested, thus the bee on the bottle. It's happy hour. And that too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. From a uh, brand standpoint with Steinway, where can you take it, Darren? You don't have a logo other than the letters. I, oh, there is a yeah. Yeah. little. Yeah. Well, you know. Can't it's see it on the uh, PM piano. Sorry. It's interesting to, to talk to German manufacturers. I was in Germany last week, and you know, for them, it's all about the product, uh, but it's not the emotional connection to what the brand is all about. Um, and you know, people don't buy products; they buy into brands. Uh, and there's that that um, that that squeezing of the heart that needs to happen. And that's job number one for me over the next uh, 12 months. Certainly, is making that that relevant. Uh, Switch shift gears a moment uh, to talk about your peer group. Uh, one of the studies that we just participated in with called Brand or Marketing 2020 suggested that those marketing organizations that invest more than three days a year in training for the team double brand performance than those that don't. Consequently, we think the head of HR actually could be an interesting new peer contact for you all. Can you talk a little bit about how you two are building relationships with your peers? Who do you spend the most time with? Perhaps the head of sales? Yeah, Lee, yeah. I, I, I actually, I think overwhelmingly, uh, I spend time with our distillery team, right? I mean, quality. Somebody's got to do yeah, it, right? Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean, a, a, at the end of the day, um, the product's got to be real. I mean, we're both alums of Coke, and, and uh, I'm a loyalist, but it's brown sugar water. A, at the end, uh, was that heretical to say that? Yeah, I, no, yeah. it's all good. Um, but no, I mean, it's, it is a, it's, a, it, it's about the product itself and about the process and about the cultivation of the agave. And so I spend a, a lot of time with the distillery team, talking to them, understanding um, what we can and cannot do. Obviously, new to the spirits industry, 
uh, new to Patron and building relationships with them. I mean, all of the crazy marketing ideas I come up with, yeah. they're tasked with bringing them to reality. I but imagine it's the it's same. It's the manufacturers who are, I mean, they're doing things that are true, that are real, that are tangible. I mean, that's what the story, for me, it's you know, the fact that we have two factories uh, in big urban metropolitan centers that are uh, with products that are made by hand by real human beings that you can look into their eyes and connect with you, know, you can't manufacture that sort of stuff it's um, it's awesome it's, it's what the you know you, you do a lot of in the social media uh, space but the social media or anything else in our world is all about stories mm -hmm. and stick ability and that's what we've got to be able to get to so I, I'm with you I think my, my space, is or my time is most spent with people who make the product uh, and so that we can learn from it and figure out what the hell bees do right yeah We're and, and we and I, d I just add quickly that for us there's an interesting cultural phenomenon because you're dealing with a haci hacienda workers in mexico um, and taking out those at the very top of the organization i'm talking about the men and women who are really down in the distillery um, the, the cultural differences dealing with this American chief marketing officer, um, it's really interesting trying to break down those barriers um, and try to flatten out the organization, be able to hear directly from them when I'm out of my, you know, out of my mind and off my rocker and some of these ideas. And that's been a really interesting experiment, getting open, honest dialogue and crossing those that's cultural divides. That's when they Spanish and you don't understand that? Absolutely, yeah. yeah, thankfully I know it, enough. Um, it's funny. Uh, both of you work on brands that are aspirational. One of the things that most organizations struggle with today is pricing. How do you aspire to be premium and go to land that nobody else has gone to? You both happen to be in that space today, and you've done some amazing things, specifically even for a $15 drink. Can you give the group counsel on how th they should think about pricing and to be bold and courageous? I mean, our, our most typical price point is $100,000. Um, and the biggest challenge is salespeople who don't have the guts to be able to sell something that expensive. They, they're not, they're n they don't have the true understanding and belief in what the product is. So it goes back to understanding the product, the story, the belief of what the specialness is for that amount of money. By the same token, there are thousands of people around the world who would drop that sort of money in a heartbeat. Um, so it goes back to data and to being able to understand truly who your, your customers, not who they are, but who they could be, and making it relevant to them, and then making that value proposition come to life. I mean, where yeah. will we see pricing go? Yeah, hopefully up. Um, we're, yeah. we're, no, I, I, I think, um, and the truth is, if actually, if you look at our trajectory, it, it has gone up. We just introduced a four-year-old tequila is aged in bourbon barrels. It's $425 a bottle. And we've basically evaporated, no pun intended, uh, inventories for the next several years. Um, the, the one thing we find, it's interesting when you, when you mine sort of the social conversation around Patron, is that our tequila is linked to these mom important moments in time and experience, right? So if we follow a social conversation, it's birth of a child, it's graduation, it's a job promotion, it's an engagement. And the investment in those moments with a special spirit, even when it manifests itself, take the $425 bottle out and say that ends up being a $60 drink, yeah. is a nominal investment when you think about how it's linked to yeah. that special moment. Yeah. And that's one of the things we're really trying to exploit in our marketing is linking us to that moment and making a more emotional tie uh, that transcends what's in the bottle. Yeah, Great. Totally. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for giving these two the time. These are masters. I hope the conversation continues over dinner and beyond. Thank you gentlemen both for doing this. Really appreciate it.